Welcome to part three of the chapter 23 lecture. The, in part two, we, we talked about the money supply and how that was a big issue and the Gilded Age presidents and their, their belief in laissez-faire capitalism and not wanting to regulate the economy or to get too involved in, in the problems of the industrial era. Another issue that appears, and this one's a little bit more interesting, is the problem that it's being shown in this political cartoon. And if you pay, pay uh, attention to it, You'll notice, to the victors belong to the spoils, and of course we have a very famous name, A. Jackson, right there, and this giant pig kind of feasting upon fraud and bribery and plunder. And this was the problem of something that had been around before Andrew Jackson, something that Andrew Jackson kind of increased because of his idea that we should bring more people into government, and especially those who are loyal, and that is this kind of idea well, it ain't no fun if the homies don't have none. And that's the spoil system. And there was a growing concern, this, this idea to the victor belongs the spoils. You know, the spoil system where you reward your supporters with political positions. And you give them a position not because they're competent, but because they're loyal. And what was happening is you had a lot of unqualified and incompetent people who were serving in government positions. Um, and the reason why they were serving in those positions was because they were loyal and because they were supporters. And there was a growing movement to kind of deal with this major problem. And once again, Andrew Jackson gets associated with it, but it's been around for a long time, even before Jackson. And so this reform is referred to as civil service reform. And these individuals want to advocate for a professional civil service based upon merit. Get the rascals out. Get rid of those people who are incompetent and have people who are there because they are qualified, because they have earned it, and because they deserve it. In fact, what you get happening is a organization being formed called the National Civil Service Reform League. And you get people like a uh, senator from Missouri, Carl Schurz, uh, an editor of the magazine called The Nation, E.L. Godkin. Um, you don't need to memorize these two guys' names, but they created an organization called the National Civil Service Reform League. And the whole purpose of that organization was to reform government and reform particularly the civil service, those who serve in government. Now, in 1870, unfortunately, the Republicans are divided again. Um, and they're divided over many issues, but this issue also divides them. And on one hand, you have a group called... Uh, let's get ready to rumble! The Stalwarts. Um, and the Stalwarts are those who support patronage. They support the soil spoil system. Patronage is the idea of giving positions in exchange for loyalty. Um, and patronage, they are supporters of it. So they're against civil service reform. And they're also, and this is because it's, you know, before all of this, you know, Reconstruction stuff is completely gone, they're against Rutherford's haze to reconcile with the South. Um, they don't like that he is trying to kind of make nice with the South. So the stalwarts are also talking about that issue. Well, the other end is a group called the half-breeds. <laughs> And the half-breeds, not only do they back Hayes' lenient treatment of the South, but they also back civil service reform. And the leader of this group is a guy by the name of James Blaine. And he'll come up a couple of times in your chapter. So you got these two groups, the stalwarts, the half-breeds. I told you this chapter is horrible. And in 1880, you have the Republican candidates running. You have James A. Garfield running with Chester A. Arthur as his VP. And they're running on a platform of a high protective tariff, and they're also talking about reforming the civil service, reforming the spoiled system. Well, 
lucky for Garfield, he wins the presidency. Like all these elections in the Gilded Age, you have the popular vote is extremely close. Um, very small margins of victory for all the presidents of this period of time. Garfield wins merely by 40,000 votes out of 9 million plus. Um, he becomes president, and not too long after, poor Mr. James Garfield is A, getting a back spasm, or B, dying. <laughs> Four months after taking office, a individual by the name of Charles Gadoon shoots Mr. James Garfield, assassinates him. He actually lives for like I think it's like eleven weeks, um, and kills Garfield. Uh, he reportedly said upon the assassination, I am a stalwart and Arthur is president now. Uh, this was a guy who wanted to be appointed and he basically kills the president with the gun you see right here. Garfield's dead. Goodbye to James. And now Chester Arthur is president. And there's even some talk, not, not you know, widespread, but there's even some talk that maybe Chester A. Arthur had something to do with this assassination. Maybe he did it to become president. You know, Chester A. Arthur had a reputation. He's really the symbol of corruption of the spoil system. He had benefited from this. And one of the things that Chester A. Arthur does, surprisingly, because he is, like I said, the symbol of this patronage and this corruption is he decides to throw his support behind civil service reform. The sacrificial lamb, the civil service reform, you know, Garfield's death, a positive thing that comes out of it is that this kind of brings this issue to the forefront of American politics and Chester A. Arthur, basically, the result of it is the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act, which is passed in 1883. The Pendleton Act, as it's oftentimes called, the Civil Service Act, is passed by Congress. Uh, it's named after the Senator of Ohio, George Pendleton, who helped sponsor it. And basically what it does is it sets up commissions where there would be competitive examinations, so people would actually have to take tests. They would have to prove that they're um, suited for the job. And there would be standards for those federal jobs. And the whole idea here would be you would get a professional civil service which would be accountable and reliable and qualified for the positions that they were serving within the government. And so Chester A. Arthur uh, helps with this act, with Congress, helps create the professional civil service that in theory we have today where the government would function based upon merit versus a sense of loyalty. At Chester A. Arthur as president, a um, couple things to know, Civil Service Act. Uh, other than that, like I said, these presidents aren't going to do a whole lot, um, but we will see what happens to him in the next lecture because in 1884, Chester is going to say bye-bye, and we'll pick this up in Lecture 4.